Hey, welcome to our show. Today we're going to talk about police, gun safety, uh, you know, some really controversial issues. And with me today is my guest, uh, Ted Moody, who is a former assistant sheriff Correct. Right, of Clark County, recently just uh, retired. That's right. That position. But, um, but while you were sheriff, you were very instrumental in creating um, a lot of programs for Metro. And, and some of them are the most important programs that we have in our community. Thank you. Uh, you and I had talked a week or so ago, for instance, about this uh, Metro crisis intervention. Is that uh, that you were involved in, um, in, in creating, uh, creating? And we were also talking about how, when we talk about terrorism, um, what a target Las Vegas would be and how lucky we have been. I don't know if it's luck, maybe it's a lot of good planning, how, but how, yeah. you know, how we haven't had incidents here because when you think about potential targets with the number of hotels that we have, the rooms, the, the population um, areas, the malls, et cetera, um, boy, it takes a lot of preventative work, doesn't it? It sure does. It sure does. I founded the, the, you mentioned the crisis intervention team. I founded the crisis intervention team in 2003, and this every day is um, uh, training, uh, poli giving police officers the skills and the knowledge that they need to work to reduce violent outcomes when the police interact with people who are mentally ill and in emotionally crisis, in emotional crisis. It's incredibly important in this community. We, we all know that mental health services in the state of Nevada uh, leave a lot to be desired. And so uh, we've had a number of high profile incidents here where the police have used deadly force and persons who were later determined to have been mentally ill have been seriously injured or killed. A, a incredibly important program for the police as well as for the community. Um, the, the issue of, of uh, homeland security and, and Yeah, and I was kind of mixing uh, two, yeah. two it's issues. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's okay. The, the yeah. issue of homeland security and terrorism is also one that for any competent police leader has to be on your mind 24 hours a day, seven days a week, particularly in a uh, community like Las Vegas. We have 20 of the 27 largest resorts in the world sitting out here on the Las Vegas Strip. We've got to make sure that uh, the gaming industry is, is protected, that the people who come here, 40 million of them a year, who come here to enjoy themselves at our mega resorts are safe. Um, all we have to do is look around the world over the past decade and we can see plenty of examples where dynamic terror incidents targeting these so-called soft targets, you know, um, resort industry targets. Mumbai, India, November 2008, great example of that. That's what, in my opinion, really changed the game and, and, and really had to cause those of us who, who presume to be police leaders in the United States to, to really wake up and step up and realize that we had a lot of work to do to make sure that we were prepared. Yeah, and th even recently with the, uh, you know, the terrorism over at the mall um, in, uh, in Kenya. Kenya. You know, what, what can Metro really do? What can police really do in that kind of you know, um, instance? When you have you know, a dozen terrorists rushing into a mall, weapons, shooting, hand grenades. The, the police can do a lot. And, and actually it's tied to responding very rapidly and taking action very rapidly. Any delays at all will result in a, in a higher death toll. There's something that we in, in law enforcement circles refer to as a stopwatch of death. Every second, once a dynamic attack like that begins, whether it's a single individual who's an active shooter such as occurred in uh, Newtown and in many other examples across the United States, or it is a, a team of of uh, very determined, fairly well-trained individuals, such as those who were involved in the attacks against uh, mega resorts in Mumbai, such as those who were apparently involved in the attack against the mall in Kenya. Uh, people are dying every second that action is not taken. These groups always have a tactical plan. They're always in the process of executing on that plan. When they are, when they are determined to die fighting for what they believe in, there's not going to be any ability to negotiate with them. At the end of the day, they're going to fight until they're dead, and they're going to kill as many people as they can kill in the meantime. So police officers have to, be, uh, have, to have the right training so that they can respond as safely as they possibly can into what is going to be a very dangerous you know, combat situation. Uh, and they have to have the right training to be able to do that. 
So, so that's what we've done here is we've, we've worked very hard since 2009. Uh, I developed and institutionalized our multi-assault counterterrorism action capabilities program to make sure that Metro police officers are the best trained and equipped police officers in the United States to respond to an event like that. So all these issues really come down to training. A lot of them. I mean, this is, you know, education, training, Absolutely. preventative. I mean, you can't anticipate every possible scenario, but you can certainly learn from each one. That's right. right. And even when we, we talk to, most people would agree that the most pressing challenge facing, facing the Metropolitan Police Department today has to do with police use of deadly force. You know, obviously, the last three years in particular, uh, the Metro has been involved in this controversy swirling around um, uh, police officers' uh, use of deadly force and our ability to, to review the actions of officers effectively uh, after the fact. Um, we've got to really focus on a culture that works to prevent the need to use deadly force in the first place. But uh, when that decision has to be made, and it will, uh, police officers occasionally have to use deadly force. That's what, one of the things that we hire them and train them to do for society. And in the vast majority of cases, the overwhelming majority of cases, when, when Metro officers and most police officers across the country have to use deadly force, their actions are above reproach. But we've got to have a process in place that is credible, uh, that is fact-based, that is constructive, uh, that can look at those actions and uh, in, the, in those rare, in those very rare instances where uh, there was a problem, we've got to be the ones to deal with it. You're referring to the uh, use of force review process. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain that's what happened, some of the history of that? Um, I think a lot of our viewers may not be uh, all that informed about, uh, what is it, the Ralston uh, case? Um, and what the ramifications were that that led to, to you retiring from Metro? Certainly. Um, uh, Metro's Use of Force Review Board has been around for a very long time. But um, uh, in, in order to make that process uh, evolve and make it more effective, I was given responsibility for it, Ed, in, in June of 2012. And we completely revamped and, and uh, overhauled that process. And who's, we, who's we? Uh, well, I, I led uh, that. Uh, charge to retool and overhaul mm -hmm. the the review the use of force review board. I relied on some some very talented um, uh, leaders within Metro to assist me, but also on some great people from within the community. We went out into the community and identified smart, dedicated, unbiased people who wanted to work with us to help us uh, identify, recruit, and and prepare citizens to participate. Uh, in the review process, the, the the board consists of four civilians taken from the community, and three um, commission members, three voting commission members from within the Metropolitan Police Department. As the chair of the board, I was the eighth member. I don't, I didn't vote in my capacity as the chair of the Use of Force Review Board, um, but we we built the right process. We built the process that has the ability to help us restore the trust and faith of the community and the ability of the Metropolitan Police Department to do this important job itself, to look at use of deadly force incidents and when the, when the officer's actions were correct, to stand up and say that they were correct, but when there were issues, to deal with those issues. And it, and it rarely means that somebody has to be terminated, but occasionally it will. And uh, the community wants to know that they can trust us to do that. So uh, you referred to the Jakar Rostin case, um, was, the, was the first case that the newly revamped Use of Force Review Board heard that resulted in a recommendation for termination. Uh, for me, this is not about Officer Rostin. It's not necessary for me to get into the details of that case. It's about the credibility and the integrity of the process as a whole that is critically important to the future of Metro and the community. Again, I, I emphasize over and over, if we don't get it right, somebody else is going to come in and do it. Uh, the board uh, heard... Somebody being like the federal government. External oversight of some kind, and that can, mm -hmm. take, that can take many forms. It can be the federal government coming in and imposing some kind of process. It can also be a process that's set up by a, a local government. In our case, it would be, you know, the county commission uh, or, or, or the county commission and, and the city council if they had to deal with it. Um, 
best intentions behind these processes across the country, but they always bring controversy. Uh, they're not healthy for the police departments involved. They're not healthy for the communities involved for the simple reason that communities want to believe their police departments are doing the right things because they want to do the right things and because they believe in doing the right things. They don't want a police department that's doing what it has to do because uh, somebody else has forced them to do it. Right. So, okay, so the, the process went forward. Um, there was a determination by not you, but by the seven members who did vote of, of finding uh, it was an unauthorized use of force, or what was the finding? It was uh, gross inappropriate use of force. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. in that case, the, the officer had uh, shot a, a young man who turned out not to have been armed. There were a lot of factors involved in the case. The board heard hours of, of evidence presented by the critical incident review team. It heard testimony from the officer involved, and based on the totality of circumstances, that group worked very hard to make what was um, a very difficult and very courageous decision in that case. And, and I've said publicly before, and I'll say it again, having heard it all and having been there to see it, I believe they made the right decision. Right. So is that decision a recommendation, or what happens after a decision is made? Well, um, the board doesn't have final authority. The, the, the sheriff, as the head of the organization, the CEO of the organization, has a tremendous amount of power. And as the sheriff has said publicly and uh, on several occasions, he, ha he does have the final say. And, and my position is that that should not change. However, because the sheriff has so much power in these cases, he or she should use it only extremely rarely and under extraordinarily unusual conditions. For example, uh, it's determined that there was some egregious due process violation of the employee's rights. Uh, some new piece of evidence becomes available that wasn't available when the board made the decision. Uh, I'd be the first one under those circumstances to stand up and call time out and if I had to, to reverse a decision of the Use of Force Review Board, I would approach it a lot differently. I would talk to the members of the board and explain to them what the issues were and why I was going to do what it is I was going to do, and I would be able to explain that decision to the community in a way that made sense. But short of that, short of having some solid, legitimate reason, uh, get out of the way and make sure you got a good process in place and get out of the way and support it. So um, I guess what the sheriff didn't follow the recommendation, um, you subsequently resigned from, That's correct. from, from Metro. That's uh, correct. I'd been with Metro for 30 years. 30 years, two months. <laughs> okay. Is that a, that's got to be a hard decision. I mean, it's, I mean, it's obviously very principled on your part. Thank you. To, to do what your conscience is telling you to do. Um, but after being a career police officer, to give up a career after 30 years based upon principle is, a, I would think, a very tough uh, decision to make. What were some of the, the, the thoughts that you had when you made that decision? Well, uh, thank you for asking. The, de the decision for me was clear um, immediately. Mm -hmm. I knew what I had to do. It didn't make it any easier. Um, 30 years, two months on Metro, and two days later, I had everything, all of my uh, uh, stuff out of my office, and, and I was gone from uh, the organization. It was the most surrealistic experience of my life. It was, you know, I was just kind of watching this happen, and it just seemed all very strange. But Here's the thing. I was the poster boy for a process that I truly believed in. When I took over that use of force review process in June of 2012, I really sincerely believed that we were going to be doing things differently. Uh, I went out and convinced a lot of great people for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect that we were going to be doing things differently. Um, a lot of people believed in me. They believed in the process because I asked them to believe in it. So. Bottom line is I put my reputation on the line with a lot of good people. And I was placed into a very uh, uh, bad position. Either I was going to stand with the sheriff on a decision that I knew was going to be a very bad one that was going to hurt the good cops at Metro uh, more than anybody else, but also the community, or I was going to stand with the people that put their faith in me. And for me, the decision was very clear, and I've never had one second's worth of regret. Yeah, well, not an easy decision, as I said, yeah. because the sheriff appointed you. Isn't that an appointed position, assistant sheriff? So yes. you're like his guy, and uh, yes. and you, you have to take a, a different track, I guess. I was appointed to deputy chief under yeah. Bill Young, and I was appointed to assistant sheriff under under uh, Doug Gillespie. Yeah. Uh, 30 years is a long time. You kind of worked your way up. 
Um, I remember at one time you were in a robbery detail, mm. right? In fact, uh, Ted Moody was on our show in 1995. <laughs> oh, we, no. have a, we have a clip. Let's, oh, take a, no. let's take a look at this uh, when you're on robbery detail. I might want to close my eyes here. <laughs> okay. More, uh, uh, more weapons, more guns being used in robberies than there were several years ago? Yes, sir, that's a true statement, and it, and it is borne out in the statistics that are available to me uh, through the end of 1994. Although we investigated about 200 fewer uh, robberies in 1994, there were approximately 3,600 investigated by our detail in 1993 and approximately 3,400 investigated in 1994. Uh, 100 uh, more of the robberies investigated in 1994 involved the use of uh, a weapon of some kind. What type of... Uh, you know, no, typically when I do this, uh, we have a guest on who's been on a number of years ago because our, our show has been on for 25 years. So I have, you know, kind of a, you know, a, a, a compilation of, of those. Sure. But yeah. when I look at you, you look the same. You think so? I don't think yeah, so no, at all. I, don't know. I think, my God, what's happened to me? Look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You look, I think you look the, better than you did then. Like the, what was the beard? You know, it hides part of it, the face. It, yeah, it's, it works well for you. <laughs> So um, getting back to uh, the, uh, the Homeland Security thing, because one of the complaints that you saw nationally and locally is that at the time of at 2001, um, there wasn't a lot of coordination between the federal government, the state governments, the local governments, FBI, et cetera. How, how's that working now in, in Las Vegas, the cooperation with other um, enforcement units? Well, I, I do think there's a significant, um, a significantly increased amount of cooperation and communication between uh, federal, state, and local organizations, but I don't think it's anywhere near enough. And to be quite candid with you, I think a lot of it is very superficial, and it looks good on paper, and it sounds good on paper, but is it really resulting in the sharing of important information that is going to help uh, local agencies in particular uh, uh, to prevent uh, the next terror attack in the United States. In, in fact, is it resulting in the sharing of important information that local authorities may have with the federal authorities to help them uh, perform their, you know, they're the primary organizations, FBI for counterterrorism right. in the United States. Um, I don't believe it's happening anywhere near enough. We've got to uh, work on substance and, and get away from this focus on, on uh, this, these surface programming and things that look, great, look good. I mean, we spend $8 million a year on a fusion center uh, here in Southern Nevada, and there are a lot of really smart people involved in that process uh, who would agree with me today that uh, there, we're still a long way away from where we need to be. Uh, why is that? Are people just, uh, agencies just territorial? In, in that they don't want to share the information. I mean, this happens in a lot of um, organizations. It happens uh, in, in the medical field, trying to find cures for certain diseases. You have drug companies and uh, hospitals and, um, and scientists maybe working separately, and they're not really working, sharing together and working kind of in a pipeline to move things forward a, as a unit. Some of it is territoriality. Some of it is people want to take an, a particular investigation, particularly if it's got if, they're, if we're talking about valuable information. Nobody minds sharing information that they know is is uh, of very little value, right? Mm -hmm. uh, th those are the items that we can share very easily to create the impression that that we're communicating well and sharing information. But when it comes to information that does have value and that may be pertinent to an ongoing investigation. This is where the challenges arrive. This is when it's also most critical, but this is where the greatest challenges arrive. The people responsible for that investigation want to keep the, informa the information very close to their vest uh, for some legitimate reasons. They don't want the information to get out and damage their ability to conduct uh, that investigation to completion, identify suspects, make arrests, things like that. And also the territoriality issues do yeah. come into play. After you resigned and then after Sheriff Gillespie decided that he was not going to seek another term, you decided that you were going to run for sheriff. I did. What factors weighed uh, into that decision? Because we, we need change at Metro, and most people that I talk to in the community would agree with that. I'm not talking about a need to throw the baby out with the bath water. Metro's doing a lot of things right. We've got a lot of great people in this organization. We need to keep doing those things as well as we're doing them and learn how to do them better. 
but there are a couple of key areas where we have got to make some important changes and we've got to make them fast or uh, I really believe the future of Metro is in jeopardy. Number one, we have to uh, 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 cha really change the culture and begin to focus on preventing, uh, reducing the frequency of police use of deadly force. There's only two ways to do that. Number one, it's through innovative training. It is uh, getting, and here's the box that everybody talks about wanting to get out of, we've got to get out of it. We've got to have an open mind and look for innovative new ways to uh, train officers and equip officers to help them reduce the need to use deadly force. And number two, uh, it'll, it's through uh, pr appropriate accountability. Uh, we've already talked about that. After a police officer has to use deadly force, there has to be a credible system in place that both the officers at Metro as well as the community can believe in and can support for reviewing the actions of those officers. Um, number two has to do with our budget. I mean, we have to ensure that Metro is as, is as fiscally open, honest, and efficient as it can possibly be. We have to repair and rebuild relationships with other elected officials, particularly those in the funding bodies, because Rundin Metro is not a one-man or one-woman show. Rundin Metro is a minimum four-way partnership. Metro the community, the city, and the county. And as we just saw yesterday, if uh, all of those legs are not strong, the thing just isn't going to work and we won't be able to get the support we need to do what needs to be done to make Metro as effective as it can yeah. be. Yeah, and, and we're at a out of time, we can't really t mm -hmm. uh, talk about it now, but you're referring to uh, County Commission uh, turning down uh, Metro's request to, uh, to increase the, uh, the sales tax to get uh, more police. Uh, thank you so much, Assist uh, former Assistant Sheriff uh, Ted Moody. Thank you. And now Appreciate Sheriff it. Candidates, right? Thank you very much. And, um, and, you know, keeping in this kind of, uh, you know, one of the things that we can do, because Metro can't be around all the time, is that we can, you know, maybe have some better ways of defending or protecting ourselves before Metro gets there, you know, because there right. is always a minute or two before 911 calls really uh, effectuate, uh, you know, some help. And my next guest is uh, Chuck Burnett. It's going to talk about how you can defend Great. yourself. Great discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. When sorry is not enough. Enough said. Call Ed. Edward M. Bernstein and Associates. 240-0000. Chuck Burnett, um, the owner of Invictus Personal Protection, teaches gun safety, gun instruction, uh, self-defense, uh, the whole gamut uh, of trying to, hey, what can I do to protect myself until Metro does, in fact, get somewhere? Um, I mean, you, you teach everybody. I mean, you teach, uh, I've taken the class, my wife, uh -huh. my children. Why do you got to teach kids about uh, well, with, guns? With, with younger children, a lot of it's just, just safety. Uh, I often do, with little kids, we do just a, a gun safety, and for little teenage kids, really gun avoidance. Tell them, you know, if you see a gun, stop, get away, don't touch, tell a grown-up. Uh -huh. uh, a little bit older kids, though, are going to have curiosity about this, and even if your home doesn't have firearms, there's a chance that maybe it's someone else's home, uh, they're going to encounter a firearm. So if you sort of take the mystery out of it, and you right from the get-go teach them how to deal with a firearm safely. So little guys, they shouldn't be dealing with it at all without, you know, parental supervision. A little bit older kids understand that if, if they ever deal with a gun, they obey the safety rules. Don't point it at things you don't want to shoot. Keep your finger off the trigger. Uh, and so if, if you start teaching them young, you're just less likely to have kind of the tragic things of somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, picks up a firearm and, and injures a, a playmate or a friend or a sibling. Well, obviously, Metro gets a lot of training and they have mm -hmm. uh, reoccurring training all the time. Um, P, um, most of us, you know, go out and purchase a gun, mm -hmm. and you have, you know, you take a class perhaps, and then that's it. You know, you don't really mm -hmm. practice, you know, the gun's there in case you ever need it. And that's not really a good thing, is it? It is not. That's a, that's a common issue we bring up in, in concealed carry courses is uh, simply taking an eight-hour mandated course and uh, getting a little card you carry and then having your, your gun in your, in your shorts or <laughs> by the bed stand, that is not enough. And, and, and the old kind of cliched thing is uh, owning a gun makes you a gunfighter the same way buying a guitar makes you a musician. <laughs> Meaning just yeah, yeah, the, the yeah, tool yeah. is not the answer. So any skill is perishable. And, and we were talking on the break about things yeah. as, as mundane as like CPR or first aid, is yeah. that uh, you take the course and for a while you're pretty good at those skills. But two or three years down the road, something bad happens. Uh, if you haven't thought about those skills or practiced them, they're probably not going to materialize out of thin air. So you need to, mm -hmm. need to pay your dues. 
you have a bunch of terrorists coming into the mall like they did in Kenya. Uh, and if somebody's, if you're unarmed mm -hmm. and you're shopping in the mall with your children, what, what, is, what, what should somebody do? Go to cover and get away if you're unarmed, unless you're so close that they're right on top of you, in which case, fight. Uh, and uh, and you, that, teach that, that, right? you teach that, right? You teach that. Well, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, unarmed combatives, uh, edge weapons, improvised weapons, uh, as, as the old saying goes, if, if God really wanted us to hit people with our fists, he wouldn't have invented bar stools. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it's really more a mindset issue. It's, mm -hmm. it's do something. Our, our, our nature is going to be we're not used to dealing with violence. If we're suddenly exposed to something that horrific, a lot of people will just freeze or, or run in small circles screaming, um, neither of which is, is terribly useful. So. Uh, a little mental rehearsal, I guess, you know, when something like that is in the news, think about that and say, wow, what if I was there? What could I have done or what would I do different? And it, it, it gets back to just basic uh, self-awareness techniques. Anywhere you're at, you should have an idea where the exits are. Uh, you should not be so fixated on, you know, your shopping goal or your uh, iPad device. Uh, you, you should be aware of your surroundings. And so if something does happen, whether it be a fire or uh, a shooter, or mm -hmm. a medical emergency, you know, where is the nearest exit? Where's the nearest fire extinguisher? Is there a, a, a defibrillator hanging on the wall that you walk past? It's just kind of knowing what's going on around yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. And so when you have, you teach classes as well as individuals mm -hmm. and groups, right? How, how does that work? How long is it? And, well, and how often should somebody really uh, take a class? For those that wish to carry a concealed handgun, uh, the state mandates an eight hour training course. Mm -hmm. And my course is about half and half range and gun stuff and about half classroom law use of force issues. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very minimal standard of training. So some of this is a complete novice. Four hours of handgun training will give them a rough idea of how to operate the gun. It's not going to make them a very good or skilled shooter. If they continue to take what they've learned in that course and do a little bit of practice, go out and shoot periodically, uh, probably a, they'll have a modicum of skill. Uh, I recommend, I, I think probably in the 30, 40 hours of training total, which would be a course of, you know, maybe four full days of training over you know, over a short period is going to give people a pretty good baseline. Chuck, what advice do you have for people purchasing their gun f for the first time? I think it's important gun has to go bang every single time. So if I pick a quality firearm, mid-level, not necessarily the most expensive or cheapest. Uh, not just how it feels, how it looks, but you need to really shoot it. So if you're going to rent it, try it out first. And then balance, uh, if you're going to conceal it, the size and weight. Smaller guns can be a little more difficult to run fast and shoot well but easier to conceal. So just at several trade-offs. Okay. And your website is? InvictusTraining.com. If you want information or classes, call Chuck.